although it's not very nice, I will apologize. My colleague Luis Borg was not able to come, and he's the network specialist. So any network related question that you may have in this presentation, you can ask to me, but then I will forward it to him <laughs> uh, later uh, reply. <laughs> So for those of you that are not familiar with the Caribbean, uh, this is the Caribbean Arc, uh, which is located in the northern part of South America and the eastern part of Central America and the southern part of North America, of course. And in our particular case, uh, we, we base our research in the island that is today shared by the Dominican Republic and the Republic of Haiti, and particularly on the north central part of this island. As perhaps you might know, uh, this was the, the first island in the Caribbean that was uh, 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 properly uh, landed by, by Columbus and his men back in 1492. And our research area is actually located in between the main and first uh, forts and villas built by Columbus and his men during the invasion of the island and the uh, pure invasion of the Americas. So this island was formerly known by the indigenous population as IT. And back then, before 1492, the, the most conservative estimate is that the population was around half a million people. And then when Columbus arrived, he uh, actually, the, even before putting his first foot on, on land, he renamed the island as La Española. And then in a, in a census done by the Spanish in 1514 says that the indigenous population was decimated to 26,000 people. Of course, those are all relative uh, numbers, but this means that uh, within the first quarter of a century, 25 years of invasion, uh, more than 95% of the population was killed or die with diseases. So after uh, more or less six years of research, we have uh, at the point where we can um, uh, uh, begin reviewing certain hypotheses uh, on, the, on the archaeology of the island and the history of this island in the Caribbean with actual uh, archaeological data, and especially focus on, on, on the Spanish bias representations uh, and descriptions. So for this presentation, I will focus on, on one example, which summarizes actually a larger debate, uh, which is what is known as the five Casicasco map, or the five chieftain map, done in 1731 by uh, Pierre-Francois Saber Charlevoix, uh, a Jesuit priest, on the basis of early 16th century accounts, such as Bartolomé Las Casas and, and uh, Noviedo. And then he created a visual, a map, of course, representation of the indigenous spatial organization back at the late uh, 15th century. Uh, and you, as you can see here, uh, what he did was to pretty much put together all the information and create boundaries and political, hierarchical territories. And each territory was connected with a cacique or a chief that perhaps you, you read the names over here. And the thing was that this map has been used by later uh, mid 20th century and late 20th century archaeologists to replicate and actually create the political hierarchy or the interpretations about political hierarchy on the island, as you can see on the later maps. They, we think the issue here is that uh, th there was a, an implicit continuation of, 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 of ideas of territories and ethnicity based on the homogenization of the indigenous populations that eventually led to the contemporary uh, uh, construction of the official and extra-official indigenous past. So one of the colonial legacies of, of, of these uh, historical processes of, of territorial and cultural uh, creation is basically what you see here. So the Ninos population were homogenized to a single group, which were called the Tainos, and, uh, and then the territorial uh, uh, separation in the island was left to these five casicas or idea. Now, during the past six years, we have been doing the research in the, in the main research area that I, I, I showed you a little bit ago, uh, pretty much uh, focusing on doing opportunistic surveys that, as you perhaps might know, is uh, basically visiting with community members from, from different towns uh, on the region, areas where they have seen or they have knowledge of, of archaeological remains, and then combining that with our own expertise of the areas where we think uh, there might be uh, archaeological remains. And then we combine that with uh, predictive models in order to pr prioritize uh, uh, areas to be visited and, and, and to research. And both methods have actually worked quite well and allow us to register uh, around or over uh, 300 archaeological sites in this region where formerly there were around 12 or 13 archaeological sites registered before our research. 
So in these sites, we, uh, uh, or in some of these sites, we carry on, uh, uh, carry out large scale excavations, as, as you can see here, uh, or in a sample of them, also we did some uh, test pit or small scale excavations in order to, to, to understand stratigraphy, to have a, a, a better chronological uh, registry. So, in this paper, uh, we will confront, as I mentioned, this Spanish model of the indigenous territories before the arrival of Columbus. Again, the archaeological data that we, we have been recorded. And of course, hopefully, we, uh, this will lead to reevaluate the representation from a less biased perspective. And then, in this presentation, we are focusing on these uh, three methods, among many others that we have done, uh, and, and actually summarizing these three methods. So, first, uh, social network analysis that uh, just very briefly and very generally, as you may know, is the process of investigating social structures through the use of networks and graph theory. And it characterizes network structures in terms of nodes, individual actors, people, etc., and ties, edges, or links that connect them. So, in uh, this particular map, <coughs> and this part I will read because it does not my uh, expertise. Uh, well, we are using network, uh, networks created by the constructed ceramic typologies and creating landscape maps of ceramic attributes. So this image shows networks of ceramic attributes with the edges removed. And then all nodes, all the black points, are individual attribute values. And the red points, that are the red nodes, are attribute values at the site. So this map uh, demonstrates that there are uh, a couple of different technological and learning traditions at these particular sites which are in uh, the site of El Carril and El Flaco. So from this, we can interpret that uh, when stylistic variables are removed uh, from this uh, uh, ceramic series, we get similar groupings of technological traditions between the two sites, which will allow us to compare connections in how people make choices about how to make particular pots. So the second uh, uh, method is a point process model. Excuse me. <laughs> I always have the impression I'm talking too fast. And then if I, I do my presentation in 10 minutes, then you will destroy me with questions. So, <laughs> <laughs> so 15 minutes or 16 is OK. <laughs> so uh, as you probably know, a uh, point process model is, is a method uh, uh, in probabilistic theory. And it's devoted to analyzing the geometric structure of randomly distributed points in a space. So we use point process models uh, particularly and in this presentation to analyze a very uh, important feature on, on Caribbean archaeology, and these are anthropo anthropogenic mounds. Uh, well, this uh, nice sketch done by Pip Sonneman over there. <laughs> uh, the anthropogenic, anthropogenic mounds uh, have been interpreted um, traditionally, even from, from Columbus' uh, first descriptions, as an element related to agricultural activities and particularly with increase on production of agricultural activities according to some of Columbus's and, and later chronicles. And then, sorry, and then archaeologically, uh, has been, th this idea has been uh, uh, replicated and connected with the whole uh, understanding of political hierarchization on this particular region. However, so far we haven't found concrete archaeological proof that first these mounds were used for agricultural activities beyond a small, uh, a small scale agriculture in the, in the sense of kitchen gardens. And uh, actually, we have uh, 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 seen that the mounds are multifunctional. So we have uh, mounds for uh, garbage dumps uh, with funerary purposes, with settlement purposes, with uh, land management on the site. And also, very interestingly, when, when we calculate the amount of mounds, or when we observe on, the, on our database the, the amount of mounds, on the, on, the, on the whole uh, archaeological data set, we saw that most of them are located on the small size sites, which contradicts the, the, the traditional model that thought that the mounds were only present in the large site sizes, where, of course, or where archaeologists thought that the cacique or the chief were actually lived in. Of course, if you see the, the, the proportions then, the largest percentage of mounds are located on the large uh, size sites, but then again, because there is uh, a less quantity of them. So then, we, uh, in terms of statistics, we are doing also some environmental analysis on this mound. But before those results come, we wanted to see if there is a correlation between uh, the, the, the distribution of, of archaeological sites with anthropogenic mounds and certain environmental variables that can 
uh, 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 speak about a relation with agricultural activities. So we, uh, this is where the point process came to, into help. So this is a, a, an intensity surface we built on the point process model. Uh, as, and as you can see here, um, this is the, the, the one that we did for the uh, sites with anthropogenic mounds. And interestingly, the main uh, environmental variables that, that, or the environmental variables that got a significant correlation with the distribution of anthropo and sites with anthropogenic mounds were actually variables related to mountainous and intermountainous uh, 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 features. Uh, <coughs> and in contrast, when we calculated the same uh, point process model with the, the sites without anthropogenic mounds, actually we got significant correlations between the, the environmental variables related to uh, agriculture, so good soils for agriculture, and, and these sites without mounds, which has, is actually quite interesting. Although, of course, this doesn't mean that the mounds were not used for agriculture, but it only means that there is something that we need to review within this uh, type of uh, uh, data. <laughs> so, in order also to test how much this uh, point process model, or, or let's say that the correlation between the environmental variables and the site distribution is affecting the actual site distribution, we, we carry on some uh, per correlation function. So here, what, what you can see is basically that uh, for the sites with mounds, um, when we calculate the, the, what we call the null model, this is the, 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 the site distribution, we have a, a high cluster on, 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 on smaller distances that then goes to regularity as there is more distances between sites. But here you see that the, the first order trend, this is the, the point process model, uh, uh, model on, on the site distribution, has absolutely no influence or no effect, or, 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 or it's not influencing at all the, the, the site distribution. But on the opposite side, uh, for the sites without anthropogenic mounts, there seems to be some sort of influence from the environmental variables to the actual uh, regional site distribution. So uh, the third method uh, is a geographical weighted regression. So this analysis uh, is based on the idea that social processes tend to be non-stationary, and therefore the force in relationship between variables depend on the geographical place where the measures, mm, the measures were taken. So the point process model is a model that we, we, we create on the basis of logistic regression, which is an analysis that, that calculates the global relationship between the, the dependent and independent variables. And then in order to specify this, we calculate the geographical weighted regression in order to see, yes, we know that there is a correlation a correlation between uh, dependent and independent variables, but we don't know if there is a special uh, influence on that particular correlation. So for this, we use this method, which, which is based on linear regression. And then when we calculated for all the, all, all the overall database, we saw some differences in the space. That, only to give you an example, we have a couple of variables. We saw that, for example, the, the variable areas of hills and platforms, actually there is a, a group of archaeological sites that have the strongest relationship with this particular variable, and actually there are sites on the edges of this that has a, a, a weaker relationship. And for example, this with Savannah Soils and, uh, and Sandy and Arizons. So we took this and compared it with other uh, statistical and special statistical variables that allow us to eventually create what we are calling two uh, ecological zones on a, on a particular area of this research region. So then the, the ecological zone number A is located on the northern part of, the, of, of, of this region and is related with uh, mountainous um, areas, small-scale agriculture, and endemic areas of the Utia uh, and Hispan Hispaniola and Solenodon, which were the only mammals present back in 1492. Uh, this is very nice. This is horrible to taste. <laughs> <laughs> Don't eat it. <laughs> and then the, the second area uh, is, is connected to flooding valleys related to large rivers and their watersheds, areas of resident salt ponds, and endemic areas of the manatee. Don't eat the manatee because it's, it's all, all, almost in extinction, so never eat it. <laughs> and by the way, this is not a, a mermaid. It's a manatee. <laughs> Probably you know that the mermaid theory, uh, ideas, yes, it comes from, <laughs> from horny Spanish sailors, sea manatees. But well, uh, that's part of another story. <laughs> <laughs> right? All right, so 
very large uh, 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 comments on, on, on this, uh, summarizing our ideas. First of all, is uh, the network of ceramic attributes suggested that there are different technological and learning traditions at the tested archaeological sites, even though in a standard archaeological basis, both look exactly the same. On the, the point process model analysis on the mound data allow us to observe uh, local differences between the archaeological sites on the mountains and the ones on the floodplains, which suggests, we think, that these features do not seem to, to be directly related with the generation of food surpluses to sur sustain large populations with, uh, within hierarchical polities or hierarchical groups, because polities is, uh, uh, as, of course, previously believed. And third, uh, the relationships between archaeological sites and environmental variables are not given on the scale of the study area or the study region, but rather on particular sectors of it, which is something that we need to explore uh, uh, further. So this result has uh, led us to believe that uh, there is no doubt that the Spanish had a biased representation of the indigenous people, but archaeological patterns are actually confirming that they did point out some sort of, 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 of general uh, pattern, as you can see here uh, when we are uh, comparing the, the the, the uh, Charleroi maps with uh, uh, ceramic uh, distributions. Uh, however, the dynamic of local distribution may be suggesting that those global patterns could not simply be related to political territories, but rather with many other soci sociopolitical relations such as commerce or in intercommunity uh, exchange, uh, as we can see with this uh, particular example. And finally, the Spanish tried to make the indigenous landscape legible for their own nation's understanding and sensibilities by homogenizing a complex social and political organization into a five system uh, map. Uh, so what we are thinking here uh, and, and in line of, of certain theoretical debates is that uh, borders cannot be seen as fixed materialities. Uh, indigenous territories cannot be considered under contemporary assumptions, neither on, this, on their 16th century ones. But we really need to, to begin reconsidering how these differences, these global and, and regional differences, actually are, are, are representing in terms of sociopolitical relations of the groups, also in, 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 a, in a local scale. So to network analysis and spatial statistics, we are creating digital landscapes that can help deepen in the knowledge of the former diversity Although an actual change, of course, will only come uh, when uh, we dialogue between the archaeological, our archaeological knowledge and, and the local communities, especially the educators uh, in the region, which is part of another research if you want to talk about that. So thank you.